us today. Read word for word the title on the slide. Okay. The comic book. Uh, so we we are rolling, yes. We are rolling. Excellent. <coughs> okay. Well, uh, so this is a joint meeting between the uh, MSOE uh, Historical Society and the Amateur Radio Club. And our presentation today will be a complete and incredibly thorough history of the MSOE Amateur Radio Club operating under call signs 9SO, NU9SO, W9SO, W9JUE, and W9HHS. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you, John. I guess the clicker is <laughs> No. Uh, uh, so, a little quick disclaimer. There's two sides to the radio. Radios at this school. One is uh, the amateur side, which we're going to mostly focus on today, and the broadcast side. So we're just going to talk a little bit about the broadcast side, just kind of get that out of the way. So in 1922, we had a very early broadcast station under the call letters W I W A I O. They meant literally nothing. They were sequentially assigned. And our transmitter was student built, probably very shadily, just like everything else we built, uh, by us. And it, it worked for a while, to my knowledge, it worked until about the 30s, so that's very good. Uh, 1924, uh, yes. Can I add something to that? Sure. It's sure. my understanding that WAIO was the sixth licensed broadcast transmitter in the United States. That might be true. Super early. That sounds about right. Uh, there, there was some other firsts we've done, but we'll potentially talk about those later. We may be getting a commercial radio side to have WMSC do their own little thing. Mm -hmm. They know more than we do. So, 1924, we changed our call letters to WSOE, so there's many theories about what it could stand for, but the W, it's legally, it had to be there, so cool. SOE, School of Engineering. Yes, MSOE was only called School of Engineering until 1932, yes. when the school had to declare bankruptcy during the Great Depression. <laughs> then, they changed their, <laughs> then they changed their name to Milwaukee School of Engineering when they reincorporated, and so SOE would be exactly our letters. And I'm not trying to interrupt you, I'm just trying to get, clear some stuff up people don't know. So Sometimes before we got Milwaukee School of Engineering, we were School of Engineering of Milwaukee, Milwaukee. That we'll see later on here. I think we should go back to that name. I think it's cooler, but uh, you know, whatever. So those licenses were very were later joint licenses between us and the Wisconsin News. W I S N perhaps might sound familiar. Oh, thanks for joining us, John. John Shields. So we clap. So it was a joint <laughs> license. Uh, the FCC wasn't around at this time, they came later, and on the paper it said School of Engineering and the Wisconsin News. A little bit later on, it was solely our name once we had to uh, refresh that license. So basically the agreement we had is we did all the technical operation and maintenance, and the Wisconsin News talked on the radio. So then 1928, uh, we split off and we no longer had a hand in that station, so we effectively built and maintained that station until almost the 30s, and that's still in operation today of WISN. They operate on 1220, 1220 kilohertz? No, they started on 1220 kilohertz. Uh, I have a picture of it later. I don't remember their frequencies, but they're still in operation today, and uh, we, we take credit to be the birthplace of WISN. All right, any questions there? I think the doctor has them. Yeah. No, it's happening. Okay. So, John, what, what do we do? Oh, well, um, so in our current form, the Amateur Radio Club uh, serves to uh, introduce students at this university to the hobby of amateur radio. Um, we have a good amount of equipment and technical knowledge, which is a large barrier of entry to the hobby. Um, you know, it's very expensive. It requires getting a license to transmit and passing exams. Um, so by joining our club, you learn about um, the hobby, you, you become licensed ideally, and then you join us on the air. Uh, so yeah, I'll add a little bit. So initially the purpose of the amateur, amateur service was to relay messages or radiograms for free 
across the country, hence amateur versus commercial. We were not allowed to receive any compensation for our services. <coughs> and uh, the amateur service could very effectively and very quickly relay messages across the world, uh, did it regularly across the country. And we still do that today to some sense, but not as much. Uh, there is still that in, in play. The whole advantage to the amateur service in you know the 40s, the 30s or so, is that there is no infrastructure needed uh, between the points of communication, so that makes it very robust, very reliable, and very free, uh, which is all very good in the in the grand scheme of things, as it would be before cell phones, email, internet. Uh, we handled a lot of messages, a lot of traffic. All right, so how did we talk about these things? Well, in the beginning, we did Morse code. And up there I have the letters CW, CW for, stands for continuous wave, because we are transmitting a continuous wave. Now I say in the old, old days, like early 1900s, it was impossible to do CW, <coughs> because no radio could actually make a continuous wave. The best we could do is a dampened wave that would slowly die off. So technically it's not CW, it's just mm -hmm. Morse code. We have a little sound sample of what the heyday of Morse code would sound like. Uh, this is done in the modern day. It was done by me at a speed of 20 words per minute, which, if you go back to 1920s, would be pretty fast. I was thinking about bumping this up to 40 words per minute, which is almost incomprehensible. But who cares? So this is what it sounds like. But what are you transmitting here, Noah? Explain this to them. I'm you gotta let them hear it. It's quiet. Do you think they're gonna decode it? Are we gonna ask them if anyone understands it? I'm gonna ask Aiden. Okay. Oh. All right, Aiden. What did I said? I'm pretty sure our call sign was in there. Yeah. So I so said, I John. CQ, 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 W9H, HX, CQ, CQ. Uh, I said CQ, CQ, DE, W9H, HX, W9H, HX, K. So. It, we have a very specific format of Morse code uh, because it's been standing so long. So we send CQ, which means calling any station. It's very rhythmic. The C's and the Q's form a very nice little melody there. Uh, we have lots of little abbreviations. So DE is one that's been going forever since the Titanic sunk. Uh, they sent CQD, which is the old distress call. But DE is, is uh, short for the French for from. Okay, cool. W9HHX is in there because that's our station and you send it twice because you might mess up the first time or they might miss it. And we send a trailing K, which Aiden, why do we send a trailing K? To indicate that we're done transmitting. To indicate we're done, we put a K. Uh, just hope your call letters don't end in K. Initially voice, there was a sound sample, but we do voice things. And that would have been even back to 30s, maybe late 20s would have been AM. We can send images, we can do digital modes, including radio teletype, which we have a lot of radio teletype awards. We did a lot, a lot already. And even more, there's hundreds and hundreds of modes on how we communicate. Uh, take a little, a little break to think. So over the years, we had a number of different call letters uh, the first one was 9SO, which uh, most of these actually predate the FCC and federal fund things. That was our original call. Later we appended an NU to that, and the NU stood for North American United States. That's because, well, we were running out of letters, because having a one number and two letters doesn't give you a lot of options. <coughs> so we experimented with adding a prefix, and we chose NU for North American United States. Later, the FCC came along and put laws into place. We had to put a W. Now, all these call signs were actually held by one of our founding members, William P. Gaynor, who was a commercial radio operator who held these. So when he graduated, we needed another call sign to steal, and we stole W9JUE. And then we got, in 1949, our current call sign, W9HHX. So, anything to add, John? Um, well, I think you hit it. I mean, basically, a call sign is just how you identify yourself on the radio. Oh, I was going to say, uh, they're very recognizable. Like, people know my call sign, people know our call sign. They're very, oh, we hear them on the air, and it's very cool. Uh, very short, very sweet. 
Right, very good. Mm -hmm. This is, on this picture, I, we'll talk about this. W1AW station, this is in Connecticut. A very historic station, it's the Henry Person Maxim Memorial Station. That's still active to this day. Our club has contacted them at least twice. And we have some cards for them to show around. And they have a lot of fun things in terms of history. It's the head of the American Radio Relay League, which we were one of the first affiliated clubs with them uh, in history. So the ARRL is like the largest organization for amateur radio in the United States. Um, pretty well known, yeah. you know, they, they have a lot of funding, a lot of members. So. And in the day they would set radio relay standards. Obviously this is how you do this, uh, this is how you should communicate and all that fun stuff. They would put out call books. So if you go back to all this was meant to send messages like a cell phone system kind of. Uh, there would be a very large book made about yay thick. It would have every amateur station, their call sign, their address, their operating hours, you had to adhere to operating hours, and their power level as well. And some of these guys ran large power levels, but because electronics were not what they are today and incredibly inefficient, uh, we're still blowing them out of the water. Uh, there would be, say, there would say about two kilowatts uh, of input power which this radio should be able to do more than uh, if it was working. It might, I don't know. I actually don't know. The okay. ARRL also published a QST, which is like a publication they would issue. Okay. And if you go in the special archives downstairs, you will see that MSOE owns issues of QST dating back to 1940. Uh, 1928 is our earliest copy. Oh, really? Which is the first edition of QST. <laughs> And they were as new as 1980 something. There's about a whole wall of them. Like, legitimately, a quarter of that room is QSDs. So, if you want to read stuff, uh, there's lots of stuff. All right. Yeah. Yeah. John, would you like to talk about. Oh, and here's that card I was referencing that had our frequency. This has a thing on it. Oh, okay. WSOE operated on 245.9 meters. And if you do 300 divided by that, that's our frequency. And, uh, in megahertz. Uh, I don't know what that is, but about a thousand uh, kilohertz sounds right. 9SO, we operated 40 and 80 meters, which are, this 40 meters is 7-ish megahertz, 80 is 3.5-ish megahertz. Right, very cool. Uh, so these are used to, you talk to someone and you send them a card confirming, yes, we talked. Uh, here's our address, 467 Jackson Street, that's currently under a highway. Um, that would be 1220 kilohertz. It was 1220. Okay, perfect. Oh, there's that School of Engineering of Milwaukee. This one is dated June 25th, 1927 at 7.09 a.m. Uh, we talked to an 8DAX. I don't know who that is. Might be in my comments. I can't really read this guy's handwriting. And this is in the handwriting of William P. Gaynor. To my knowledge, the library is in possession of this fine piece of paper. I'm sure we are. Uh, there's many that you don't have. We have a, a U.S. mail service bucket full, and then some. <laughs> we probably love to have them, to get them out of a bucket and into a No, sorry, <laughs> sorry. They're, they're, they're not, they're, they're uh, This other one I stole off the internet. This is a guy in Japan. And his call sign, you see, has this slash MM, that's for slash Maritime Mobile. So he had a radio in a boat. Uh, probably not that boat, that's an artistic representation, but who knows. All right, uh, John, would you like to assist me in uh, displaying some cards? Oh, yeah, I brought well, a, we should pass them around. I brought a firm stack of cards. Uh, I have some that are of particular interest to me. Uh, these are all people that our club has talked to over the years, okay? This one is from Ohio. It's dated. It's dated. It's dated something. Hold on. November 11th, 1949. I was looking for a very first one, which would have been June of the same year. Uh, we started something around. This is the oldest one. Please don't need it. Please don't tear it. Uh, I want it. Okay. This one is just uh, funny. If you read the back, a lot of these are hilarious. This is uh, Eighth Special Forces Group. In the canal zone, we talked to them on 14 megahertz, 1967. 
I chose the exotic ones as much as I could. This is Turks and uh, Kai Kai Kaikos. 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 Yeah, see, I don't know how to talk. 1968. This is VP2. What is, what is that? VP2. Well, this one doesn't have a country. Uh, this one doesn't have a country. Can I get that for the video? VP. What's the call sign on that? That's a VP5, mm -hmm. so it's probably Caribbean. Oh, oh uh, it sounds Caribbean. This one is from Mongolian Republic, uh, 1969. Oh, it's taking its sweet time. Okay. This looks Perfect. like France. We have many more. El Salvador. So I can't talk each one. Netherlands. Yes, please. Why are they passing them like this? Now? Yeah, why am I passing these like this? Yeah. This one might be from Aruba. Crazy. I can't. I can't explain all of them. There, there's too many. I'm sorry, Mr. Riley. Bahamas, we called the quote, quote, sending and receiving station, no club, but they were radio syrup, apparently in some capacity. In 1924, we club, we formed our club of these four gentlemen. Uh, this guy here, this is William P. Gator himself, the guy with bad handwriting that I can't read. In our original club room at 467 Jackson Street, right? Uh, we lost Stephanie Nassau in 1930 when he had to graduate. But he joined a local club, the Milwaukee Radio Amateurs Club, still today, which I'm a member of. 1934, we got W9JUE. And originally, we used a 50 watt, watt radio for 40 and 80 meters. Later, we got a 20 meter band. That's the approximate wavelength of, you know, waves. We still use these today. Uh, actually, over the weekend, we used all three of these for a contest. Uh, my favorite and measurably the best is 40 meters. I'll just throw that in here. Uh, okay, so as as we alluded to, uh, we do emergency communications. So this one is a newspaper clipping I blatantly stole from the library. So in 1926, in 1926, I know, in Puerto Rico, there was a hurricane. It wiped out all communications to a U.S. naval base. And for some reason, None other than William P. Gaynor was awake at, it was like midnight, like 1 a.m. It's in here somewhere. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time with you. 1.15 a.m. 1.15 a.m. But uh, the, the naval base hastily put up a 40 meter set, because 40 meters is the best band, as I've said multiple times, because it's true. Why is it the best band? It's because it's my favorite. Because <laughs> it works good at night, it doesn't work great during the day. And he was having trouble uh, communicating with Washington, D.C., but because uh, we're so good and the sky was happy with bouncing radio waves off the atmosphere, they came here inside of Washington, D.C. So we took the first 142 words in what was then called Continental Code, which is now known as International Morse Code, exactly identical, the same code I am struggling to learn. And we relayed that off to Washington. Later, uh, Ad Admiral Craven, Great Lakes uh, Naval Base, said, and I quote at the very last paragraph here, if you want to read along, it's down, down there, the Chief of Naval Operations desires to express his appreciation of the excellent work done by two of your amateur operators in copying and forwarding a radiogram from Puerto Rico. Not only does this show very good operating ability, but the forwarding of the dispatch to the Navy Department indicates excellent initiative. Uh, this is something that amateurs do or have done all the time, less now because systems have gotten better and more robust. Uh, John, what is this picture? I don't remember. Yeah, so, um, you know, because amateur radio works without internet or uh, any other uh, infrastructure, um, it's still used today to some extent for emergency communication. <coughs> so, not only did we relay information on a Puerto Rican uh, hurricane, but even uh, closer to more modern times, you can see this is an MSOE student who is working with the Milwaukee Civil Defense Program um, to practice transmitting to Alaska in case of an emergency. Uh, so that's just something that I managed to do. Just another picture of some guy preparing for some emergency communications graph. And in case you need more convincing that Morse code is the best mode of communications, uh, when it comes to all this stuff, even today it's 99% done in Morse code. 
because it is a better performing mode when it comes to how far it's going to reach. Basically, you're taking all your power and you're shoving it from something 3 kilohertz wide to something 52 hertz wide. And unlike other modes, you don't need a computer, you don't need the internet, you just need to be somewhat decent at uh, Morse code. That's the really only downside to it. So if you go today and I could remote into our flex, uh, we could hear on the air Morse code after the meeting. Who knows? Oh, okay, we have cool club artifacts. Uh, this here, okay, this here is an actual radio that apparently is club property. Uh, it dates about mid 1970s. This is a Yezu FT201. It is powered entirely by vacuum tubes, uh, which are in here. Don't touch them, but they're enclosed. Uh, like, actually, though, like uh, the reason we moved away from vacuum tubes, besides being inefficient, is they could legitimately kill you if you touch them while they're at full power. Uh, which has happened to a club advisor. Well, he's not dead, but he almost. almost. <laughs> uh, there, there's about on our. We'll have a picture of it here later. But our big, big tube amplifier on the plate is about two and a half to three kilovolts. Uh, maximum plate current is 75 milliamps. Like that's well within the yes, it can kill you range. Uh, now we have solid state stuff, which is like 48 volts. It's much safer. Uh, this would be for single sideband voice or Morse code, again dates 1970s-ish, uh, this wasn't great when it came out, it's not great today, so if you want to come around and take a look, uh, you can look inside, it has lots of electronics, variable capacitors, uh, there is a Pi network in here, uh, which is very fun, uh, it's an impedance matching network, and all oh, lots of good stuff. This is also for the time when radios had their own power supplies in them, so now they have to run off the of DC, this runs off AC, so we could theoretically cover it and plug it in and make funny lights. Uh, you already saw the QSL cards. Uh, we have a we have a thing. We have another thing on this place. Oh yeah. John will demonstrate this use on me. Oh yeah, okay. So uh, let's say hypothetically it was back in even modern times. This is a Would you like to read the date and card on that okay. stick of wood please? So on this piece there is uh, some symbols that have been carved into it. Also it says one or the other, Wu Fong, and uh, MSOE Ham Club 41254. So this is from 1954. This, uh, this piece is called a Wu Fong. This is one of the legendary uh, weapons in amateur radio. So where if, you, if you're being a very bad operator, you will be punished with this. Hence the red paint on the tip of it. Um, so th this is a sacred device that amateur radio uh, has to make sure that we're all being good on the air and uh, we're all following the laws and the best practices. There are laws we have to follow, yes. Should um, we pass this around? Sure! I've only had to use it once. Yeah. Is, is, is that something that other amateur people do too, or is that something just for your club? That it is, is a ham thing. Yeah. It's like a... Is it? Okay. We so. do have a few, like, club oddities <laughs> all that I might have a picture of. I don't remember. But I theoretically could put a picture on. Um, so the Wafong, uh, next thing is our Mosley Pro 67. This is our extremely large antenna. It's on top of the CC. She's been kicking since about the 90s. It actually was on top of the C building, uh, which is where it was, where Derek Hall currently is. It was moved to the CC. <laughs> so if you're ever entering, if you're in the main entrance, you look up and you look left, and there's a 30 foot tower with a very large antenna on it. Uh, it's old, uh, it works great most of the time. How does the rotor work? <laughs> I did not include the rotor, I just included the antenna itself. It is only pointing south at the moment. Uh, we also have some club awards. We have a number of awards. Is that okay? Is that now or is that later? Uh, actually, I don't know if there's I think an award. You have scan the awards. Oh, oh, we do. Yeah. All right. I suddenly got a little. I did scan a bunch of our stuff. online now. So. John, this yeah. is this, this is your slide. This is my slide. Yeah. Um, okay, so are you, am I? Uh, you are, I've been talking too long. Okay, so, you know, as we know, Bill Gaynor and some of the other people who are running our radio club graduated, and we ceased to have an officially recognized radio club for a short period of time. Um, in 1949, we applied to the uh, FCC 
to get uh, an amateur radio license for a club at our school. So this is us receiving uh, ARRL membership, which is membership into the larger amateur radio group. Um, and our license, uh, we received that in May of 1949. Um, our first contact was made on June 4th, 1949. And um, at some point we moved to the C building and then the campus center um, with our club room. That's the C building, this picture. Interestingly, uh, we had our first club room unveiled at the 1949 MSOE homecoming celebration. It was one of the larger events at that celebration. Curious. Yeah. The, the C building is now located where Dirks Hall is. Yes. So if you guys are just um, wondering where it is. So. so if any of you have been in our current club room 1203, uh, in the C building we had two floors to ourselves. Uh, <laughs> we had quite a significant amount of things. This was our main operating room. There was a lot of stuff in there. I had presenter notes. My presenter notes got wiped. Mm. That said what everything is. Mm. Uh, maybe that was a different one. It might be on a later slide. That might be on a later slide. Because we talk about the club rooms in more detail. Just oh, more yes. About Anyways, the there's lots of stuff there. Um, none of those things we have anymore. I think that might be a FT101. No. No? No, those are Collins. I, I have a list of everything in there. Looking very similar to the 201. Every radio <laughs> from previous to the 80s looked exactly the yeah. same. Uh, they were not exactly the same, but they all looked very similar. So here's a picture of our very original club room. Uh, so, for context, this is what's called the transceiver. It's a transmitter and a receiver. In the old days, we had a separate transmitter, which is somewhere in this general area. I can't really tell. And a separate receiver, which well, is there's also headphones there and probably here. Be there. So that's the receiver, and that's yeah, the transmitter. Th this is the receiver. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we also had a bunch of cards. As you can see, they plastered the wall, like not literally plastered, but they covered a whole wall, and then some. Uh, so basically, they they set more than we do today. This is Mr. Gainer. Uh, no one knows this guy's name, so if you know, uh, please please tell me. Can I ask you a quick question about the cards? Sure. I noticed that most of them do not have postage on them. Do most people ah. mail the cards? Or <laughs> there's some that are stamped. So There's a couple that have like a stamp on them, but I also noticed there's not postage. So are, are they pre-postage paid or are so they sent via envelopes? Yes. The old cards, a number of them were sent as postcards and have stamps on them. Uh, but typically how it's done now is with what's called a self-stamped and just envelope. So you have an envelope, in there you put two things. You put your card in there, so it's all nice and protected, it doesn't have an ugly stamp on it. And you put an envelope that's addressed to yourself and stamped. So on the receiving end they just put a card in, so you pay return postage. Nowadays. Now back in the old days, oh wait, oh no I forgot, most of these are DX cards from different countries. Mm -hmm. This would have been actually done via QSL Bureau, which is a fun little thing to talk about. Also a thing the ARRL did. So what you did is you got a packet, an envelope like this, perhaps. You sent this out to the Bureau in Connecticut, full of cards. And that's because international postage is super expensive. Mm -hmm. Then you pay a little nominal fee for your yearly membership, and they sent it out to other countries' QSL Bureaus, who then distribute it back. So that's, I forgot most of these are from other countries, that's how it's sent to other countries. So then how would, how would somebody like confirm a contact, right? Like if, if they, would the bureau, would the... Mail one back. Yeah. So every amateur radio operator, Everyone at least in the US, there, it's public knowledge where you're able to get a hold of us outside of radio. Mm -hmm. Does, in, a mail address could be your home address, could be a post office, but some way to contact you by mail is public knowledge. You gotta go. I, I got that. Yeah. I was just wondering because a lot of people wrote notes on those and they would say, hey, we contacted you on this frequency, mm -hmm. on this yeah. date, using mm -hmm. and this code. Right? So when you would send a packet of the cards, would you fill those packets yeah. out after you've made contact? Yeah, so and then you send them all to them and they distribute yeah. them. Okay. Uh, so we have a few new ones. We yeah, there's some, new there, your newest one looks really nice, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's actually going to be redesigned. Yeah. So what we would do is, this is from us, we worked, we worked this station 
-hmm. this day, this time, we would send this out saying this is all of our information. We send this to them. That served as confirmation that they contacted us. No, I, I understand yeah. that. I was more curious about like the older uh, ones and having to go through the the sending station ooh. at the international place. But you would send them all of the contacts that you made from that country, right? That's what you would do, and they would distribute it to the individual person? Or, or would you send them blank cards? No, you wouldn't send blank cards, because you, you would still fill it out like... We that's what I, that's yeah. kind of what I was yeah. getting at, so yeah. yeah. But they would... Uh, well, I guess it would be... No, this, this was one from this 258. They would have to look on here and go, okay, it goes to this station, this is the U.S. station, right. yep. whatever. It would go to them, and this would all be pre-filled out with your information, because you're the only one that has that. Course. Besides the other station contacted, cool. which is how, which is why they're used as, oh, this was a two cent stamp. Oh, look at that. You know, that's how we'd be able to confirm it. Cool. So, two cents. Two yeah. cents. Postcards have gone up in price. Two yeah. cent order. postcards. These days it's sixty cents. Yep. This one has a, very familiar with that price. A one cent and a thirteen cent. Okay. Ready? 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 Uh, I don't know if it's actually in here. We have to speed run. Yeah, I'll, I'll go on a quick tangent. Quick tangent! <laughs> this one's worth mentioning because this is something a lot of people don't know. Um, either in this room or in a later room in the C building, um, we had a blue light bulb in our room. That was C building. That was, you were aware of this, yes. It was yes, in the I'm C aware of this. Uh, I don't know if it's actually in the pictures though. Uh, no, it's not because it was in the no. back of the room. It was in the back of the room with oh, a blue good. light bulb where there was an electronics lab nearby and they would flip on a switch and the blue light bulb, bulb would be on and they'd tell us do not transmit anything because we're running a lab and if you transmit we'll pick it up on our equipment. So that was something that we uh, had to deal with when we were operating our radios back in the day. We have a number of emails printed out and that's how we know these things because yeah. uh, we have lots of printed out emails. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this is a man I, I'm in good correspondence with, Hans Schroeder. I invited him to our meeting, and this is what his response was in the email. Um, I won't read out the whole thing, but basically Hans Schroeder was um, not only a student in 1955 uh, for electrical engineering at MSOE, but he also was our club advisor for some time. Um, and I believe until recently... Okay still on our license as our club advisor. Uh, yes, uh, until like 2018, I think. Mm -hmm. No, 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 2019. Uh, now Rich Phillips is on it. Uh, yeah. Hans Schroeder is old enough. I have talked to him on the radio uh, on our MS movie, Peter, and he's uh, old. Uh, <laughs> no, he, he, he lived through World War I, except that's after he moved here uh, to the US. He was born in Germany. He lived through World uh, War II. Oh. Yes, World War. Did I say World War One. Yeah. He yeah. saw his first meter shower in like 1932. Okay, we get it. He's old. Uh, he's old enough that he actually taught my father when my dad went here for a short stint. Uh, we won't get into the rest of that lore uh, today. Maybe later. Uh, okay. Quick tangent though. <laughs> yeah. in, in, interesting thing. He says passing through the then A building. If I remember correctly, the building that is now the the German English Academy mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. which is the building that like direct supply is in I believe that was the a building yeah so just in case in, in case people are wondering so like between the two buildings people go from the a building there and then they go into the C building and the w9 HHX sign that's up there on the side mm -hmm. of the C building was one of the last things that came down off that building when it got torn down in 1999. Do we know where so, that sign is? Gone. We knew it's to Adam. Yeah. It's the whole, there was, a, okay, another quick tangent, but there was a small light sport aircraft in the C building as well. Uh, to mine, uh, the school never officially knew about it. It was one of like the, the funny, funny things the students do. Uh, that is also gone. There's also a swimming pool. Anyways, there was, there was the a swim, building. The swim building pool in the basement of the C building. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so, so that's just cool. on uh, the Hans tangent. Oh, this is where it is. Um, it's in comics. Fans. Yeah. So um, this is, uh, Noah, do you want to go over this? Yeah, yeah. so this is a, uh, a zoom in of our station. And this is, so Scott Freeberg, he went here in the wild a while and he was, uh, he was a man. He did a lot of stuff. You'll see a picture of young Scott in a little bit. Uh, and he went here in 1970, so he said we used to run a lot of RIDI, which is radio teletype, which we ran a lot of RIDI, uh, CW and single sideband, which is voice. And he goes on to say there was quite a bit of two meter and six meter activity, which is cool. 
That's where we also put up our first W9HHX slash R repeater, uh, which was always on top of MLH to my knowledge. And then Tomlock uh, 9WPS worked to get our frequency coordinated with the state, which is also very cool. None of that probably means anything to you, but uh, it's cool. Here is all of our equipment. This desk was built by a student, 1975 Mark Varian, as a gift to the club. It's custom made and holds all of our equipment. We'll quickly talk about what this is. Uh, so this transmitter here, this is a Drake T4XB, and the receiver next to it is a Drake R4B. Uh, so twins, receive, transmitter and receiver. This amplifier over here is also a Drake. No, it's a Collins. Collins 30S1. Above the, and then we had a foam patch kit here. This is a heat kit foam patch so we could patch into phones. So what you used to be able to do via amateur radio was do phone calls uh, before cell phones. Right here, this is our rotor controller uh, for our directional antenna. So you can turn it around and point at different parts of the world. And there's a ham scope here. I That predates me. So I'm not, I'm not really sure what it does. I think it might just be an oscilloscope. To the right of that is a SWR bridge, uh, which reads um, for SWR things. So basically, how bad are you about to blow up your radio if the SWR is too high? And we had a, oh, a radio teletype terminal over here on top of the amp. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I, we should get too uh, in detail. Oh, you're, you're, you're right, you're right. Uh, you're right. Uh, no, go, go back, go back. Uh, Last thing I want to say on radio teletype, because you might not know what RIDI is. Um, so, with radio teletype, the early machines were basically like typewriters where they had keyboards and there were moving parts that would spin mm -hmm. yeah, and make yeah, tones. And so, the first text messaging was using radio teletype and teletype systems. Yeah. That mode is still used today uh, with computers. You can type on a computer and it'll send the same sounds. And the mechanical devices can decode that. Uh, it's all compatible. That's an interesting uh, yeah, point. Yeah. Oh, and then we move on. Oh, oh, <laughs> a fun fact here, they ran 980 watts on ready. Uh, OK, cool. Uh, John made this slide. He'll talk about it. This yeah. is a new picture, obviously. Um, yeah, so uh, we still have our repeater system on the roof of MLH. The radio club uh, somewhat frequently goes to the roof to inspect our equipment, make sure that's all working. And on Mondays, we still have meetings on our repeater system. Um, that's kind of something that we use to uh, reach out to the community with. And that uh, system, I believe the radios in our repeater system are from like the 80s. Uh, well, they're GE Master 2s, so they're from, uh, that would have been early 90s. OK. Yeah. What, what, what year, like, are you talking about, like, is this the stuff in the repeater? I'm trying to fill in a blank for you that I probably know. Sure. sure. So MSOE moved from the C building. It C building closed in 1989 and opened in 1990 the Cudahy Student Center, which is the the you know the campus center building. Mm -hmm. So MSOE purchased that building in '89, but it didn't open until 1990. The Amateur Radio Club uh, offices went in on the third floor there. And I think you're, it's, some of it is still connected through the Dean of Students mm -hmm. office, right? There's a bunch of the, there's still, the background there's still holes in his ceiling. Yep, <laughs> absolutely, because that, that was how they like connected to some of the stuff um, to that. So it would have been 1990 that that new equipment, exactly that year that that new equipment was put into that space. Yeah, so. I'm gonna, I um, recently got access to our old mm -hmm. email. Um, I was going through some old stuff. I think it was put in MLH relatively recently, without uh, within the last ten years. But mm. we'll have to go through those so, again and double check. This is kind of a funny thing, but we, uh, to my knowledge, we were always in MLH. Uh, we have old pictures to prove it. But basically, we were in the elevator rooms, and the building code changed. It says no, you can't do that. So there was we stuff happened uh, with more than just stuff. Stuff moved. Uh, that thing on top. This equipment is separate there. from what's on yeah. the top of the CC and then the C building. This is a separate system that was installed in MLH. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. But now I'll go back to Phil. Okay. Well, not yes. but. Yes. And I want to and yes. for you guys, yes. right? Of course. There's no buts here, right? Like, um, from what I understand, the the, the full-on transmitter was always on the top of MLH, and they set up yeah. some of the equipment so that they could transmit or relay from the top of the CC over to MLH. 
Yeah. And then it got complicated because in 1981, or actually in 1980, the students at MSOE ran a pirate radio station in Milwaukee, okay, which was in a low band frequency FM, which then they got caught running that radio station, and then they licensed WMSC in 1981. But before they did that, they wanted to play music and rock out and be cool. So they actually used, I think it was the radio club's original transmitter from MLH, where they transmitted to like a one mile radius of downtown. They eventually got caught. It kind of became a problem. They then applied to have the original, and I'm not trying to get into, into too much WMSC radio history, but it deals with your club, because mm -hmm. your yes. club is kind of guilty of that. So, like, oh, um, yeah. so eventually w, WMSC you, uh, started. When WMSC started, where the, where the MLH lounges is where the WMSC radio offices were, and they were there because it was mm -hmm. the shortest distance to get to the actual transmitter once they became federally licensed. Mm -hmm. We so. yeah. are still in correspondence with one person who used to work down awesome. in the, yep. the MLH lounge. Yep. Yep. And, then, and then Tom Crawford, who is the current general manager of WMSC, has been at least a volunteer no, at WMSC since the very first year sure. it became official. And he knows some of the story of when it was pirate and sure. yeah. unofficial. So. We do have a card somewhere from one of the guys who actually started WMSE. Uh, I don't remember where I put it or where I saw it, but yes, we have a card somewhere. Mm -hmm. And oh, also regarding the old GEs, every time uh, he says that, I just die. A so <laughs> <laughs> we have old GEs for three reasons. First is because they're really cheap, they're really easy to repair, and they're good. Uh, even the big, you know, very expensive repair systems in Wisconsin use old GEs. He's again for like 25 bucks a pop. Uh, are you trash talking me losing stuff? We need to Okay, we need to keep going. Uh, okay, funny, funny, uh, this amplifier here, that's uh, a power amplifier. Uh, we still have that. We also still have this microphone. This is from the CC. Uh, this is a 486 uh, computer. Uh, this is about, this would have been the very, very early days of the CC, about maybe the 80s-ish. I don't remember exactly when. Late, 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 early, early 90s. Early 90s. 90, yeah. 90, 90 very, very early 90s. Uh, okay, moving on, we got a speed run. This is also the same building, that's the same equipment. This is the picture that made us go, oh wait, that's not the C building. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have Hans Schroeder. That's the CC. Uh, we have a very young Rich Phillips, we have a number of our awards. Yeah, mm -hmm. All right, Jack, the, the, the far end, actually go back one picture, the far end, the far left hand of those two photos, that is the Dean of Students office. Mm -hmm. Yes, now. yes, this is current yes. Kip Cuspin's office. Yes. Uh, our tower is bolted directly above his room. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still there because it can't move. We do not hold a grudge, we promise. <laughs> this is the entrance, so basically sure. you, you've all know where this is. This is Kip Cuspin's office. Mage had, it was a, it's a split office, mm -hmm. Mage had one half, we had the other half, uh, we had a couch, uh, we had stuff, you know, bulletin boards. Yeah, like right when you walk in right there, if your office is the one that's open straight ahead, there was yeah. a second office just to the right of that, which was yeah. the Mage office. Mm -hmm. and then the outer office was shared, usually used by Mage, but shared by both clubs. Yes. Yeah. And so, okay, this is our current club room. On uh, MLH, so we have this very nice picture from uh, a few days ago with the Christmas lights. That's awesome. And this was also from a few days ago. I'm practicing Morse code while well, I think Jake is actively making contacts. Uh, there's not too much to see in either of these, really. Besides up here, it's that amplifier we saw before. Uh, yeah, I think I saw the seat. Right, John? Yep. Under here, uh, no, I, I won't say it. I won't say it. <laughs> okay, sorry. Under here is our <laughs> QSL card. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> two of them. At least two. two of them. Half of them were not ours. Like, they're from someone else who was a friend of ours, and for some reason we have them. Uh, okay, moving on. <coughs> uh, so we had a swap fest. I was basically people come and they sell things. It's like a flea market. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. like a flea market, but radio computers. Nowadays, they're kind of a letdown. This was in March 1986, and I'd like to point you to there was beer held uh, at mm -hmm. this at this swap fest. Sold. 
Uh, yes. Very good. John, anything to say? That would have been the very last year that 18-year-olds could have drank. In 1987, the drinking age changed to 19 in the state of Wisconsin. And uh, I have that here. <laughs> and there's oh, stuff awesome. on the back. I love, love it. This around. That's awesome. They have our power requirements, so they wanted a large amount of power. Did they just put right on the back of it? Also, speaking of things, we have so this is from when we moved to the CC. We had a list of things we wanted. It's better. It's a better item. Uh, and they requested eleven things or so. One of them was two hundred amps of electricity, which is enough to run multiple welders off of. Wow. <laughs> Okay, we'll keep that for things to pass around now. Okay. okay. We're gonna keep going. Awards, awards. Uh, uh, okay, here's a small selection of our awards you can look at. Among them is one of the three ready competitions we won in the frame, our Worked All States Awards from 1954, our Department of Defense Armed Forces Day 1966, which is radio teletype Thank you. at 60 words per minute, because Apparently we can go that fast, and when we contact it correctly. Oh, and I told you, here's a picture of Scott. One of these three is Scott. This is from the night they won that award. Which one? That, Alexander Volta, 1976, and they drank a little bit of Mountain Dew. They had three operators, they did 24 hours straight. Uh, two during the day, one during the night. We also did that we just last did that weekend. weekend. We'll have a picture of that. The yeah. photos oh from like a slide or two ago was so from what, that. What did you have to do to get Something that's interesting way. about this, you guys. Aiden, you can actually contact as we do as possible. Yeah, I'll tell you guys this, which is kind of really fun. You'll notice that the subject on this is move of the MSU. We amateur radio club to Can the Market that Street building. So this is the Cudahy oh. Student Center. So this is their requirements of putting stuff into the new CC building. Yeah. But what's funny about that, and a lot of people don't know this, but the front of the building used to be Market Street when it was Blatt's Brewery, which is why they're calling it the Market Street building instead of the Broadway building, because there used to be a circle drive where that like green space is in the back. And that's where the brewery would actually do stuff. So yeah. this was the request. Can we please put the club meeting in, or the club into the CC? And I realized for awards, why not now? Basically, you have to establish two-way communications with a certain set of people. So for worked all states, it's all 50 states. For Alexander Volta Ritty, it's as many as you can. So you get points. And then there's also multipliers for things like states, countries, whatnot. We got first, and it says W9 land, so there's 10 call districts, we're in 9 land, which is Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and we did the best of people in those three states. Uh, here's our worked all continents, awesome. so we have all continents. If you ask ready, uh, if you ask Jake or John, Jake, how many continents are there? I don't know, seven? Seven. No, there's six in the world of amateur radio. Oh, Antarctica is thrown in with Oceania. Uh, gotcha. This is stated 1962, which is lame. Just for comparison, over the weekend, we worked five of six continents. So we did, in a day, what took them multiple years. 30 years. That's awesome. Yeah. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. We also worked digital, so we kind of cheated. Uh, they did it on, probably, CW made up most of those things. Morse code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Morse code. Oh, I'm personally <laughs> disappointed that you guys didn't get all six, so I'm just saying. I, <laughs> honestly, I was looking through it, and I'm like, I saw we worked Africa, I'm like, wait. Uh, then I looked Asia. Yeah, uh, Canary Islands comes after. Oh. I looked Asia. I'm like, oh. They go to Oceania. Oh. We worked 45 states as well. I really wanted to do all 50 states in a day, but that's a bit oh, that's, that's awesome. Those are those are great goals, you guys. I think that's awesome. So here's people running a contest and drinking Mountain Dew. Here's people running a contest and drinking Mountain Dew. You can have a Mountain Dew. Uh, John, this I think those are Mountain Dogs now. So I, I, I think John made this line, John. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's basically all, all I have to say. You know, the club continues to do many of the things we used to. I like to say we're an old dog with new tricks. Um, oh, there's more things that impress me. We run on the same radio bands. We have new equipment with computers and things, but we have oh, like Morse that. code still. We still run radio teletype. There's a lot of history in amateur radio. Yeah. And a lot of other college clubs, I have college clubs we talked about, have a lot of history. Uh, we happen to have more than most of them. We're one year older than Ohio State's club. I mean to brag, I don't let them forget about it. You, 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 you guys really are one of the oldest clubs, like in the country. So. Like, we are, yeah, we're legitimately one of the oldest clubs. 
Uh, there's a lot of colleges have clubs, uh, which is cool. Uh, we do computer control digital modes. We have radios that are 99% computers. Uh, this is the end of the slideshow. We went. Uh, thank you. We went way over. Uh, it's 7 p.m. Okay, get out of here. I guess, yeah, last thing I can show off, this isn't even really related to the club, it's something we own, it's a manual to build a Heathkit Connell Rad Alarm, this is something one of our club members had and assembled, this would be used during the Cold War to alert you if you were about to get nuked, um, so if you are interested in reading that, we have a manual on how to build that. Yeah, that station diagram needs updating, uh, that station diagram has yeah, that's a 101 on it. So that would have been late 90s.